Hello, America. I'm Mark Levin. This is Life, Liberty, and Levin, the great Bill Bennett. How are you, sir? Okay, Mark. Good to see you again. I consider you one of the wise men out there of the conservative movement of the Reagan era, which is where we first met. You were uh, head of the National Endowment for the Humanities. You were Secretary of Education. And you didn't just sit in these spots. You made a difference in these spots. You were the first drug czar. We've got a lot to talk about. Yes, sir. But first of all, I want people to know, long ago, you were a Democrat. When the Democrat was kind of a moderate Democrat party, it's kind of a moderate party. Now we see these radical leftists who got elected, and they seem to be the leaders of the party. I remember when Michael Harrington, a socialist from Massachusetts, sure. Bella Abzug, sure. kind of crazy from Manhattan, how they were pushed to the side. And yet the media promotes them. What do you yeah. think's going on? Putting them forward. Yeah, I was a Democrat because I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, Irish Catholic family. I mean, we didn't know any Republicans. I remember my mother pointing out someone else and said, <laughs> there goes the Republican, you know. But so it was kind of a natural thing. But I joined the administration, the Reagan administration, joined you as a Democrat. Ronald Reagan, of course, famously had been a Democrat. But in 86, uh, Elaine and I and my wife uh, switched. The specific thing was voting down aid to the Contras. I remember that. And one of the things about the Democrat Party that I did like growing up and as I, you know, was in my 20s, was it seemed to be a party that stood for human rights and the defense of human rights, defense of America and human rights. I thought that was a huge, huge failure. So switched uh, and became a Republican and been a Republican since. I, I don't know what, uh, what they're doing now uh, and why they're doing this. Um, it's very odd because the midterms, showed us that uh, I, I was reading the backgrounds of a lot of these people got elected as Democrats, as congressman, Marine, ex-Marine, helicopter pilot, this, that. A lot of moderates, but it looks like all the energy is on the left, and they are afra afraid of the energy on the left, and they're afraid of being embarrassed by the left. They don't want to be called anything the left calls anybody else. When I say they, I mean the leadership, Pelosi and, and the like. But we've been here before, Mark, you know, remember, 1972, George McGovern. I was checking that. It was, it was 520 to 17 electoral votes. This party has done this before. It's yielded to this temptation before. Um, the fact that the Democrats are doing that bothers me, but it doesn't worry me as deeply as the fact that there seems to be some appeal to what it is they're saying, particularly among young people. Millennials and the Z generation, Generation Z. Well, and the Secretary of Education, uh, high school, middle school, elementary. Yes, sir. They were moving left, the NEA, it's pretty hard left. Uh, they, they pretty much control the school systems, even more than the school boards, I felt. Has that gotten worse? Is the propaganda, is the indoctrination gotten worse? It's gotten worse. They are as powerful as they've ever been. The unions, you and I used to talk about this. I remember during the Reagan administration, you were looking at it from the Justice Department. I was looking at it from the Education Department. But what's happened is they have basically co-opted a lot of the education establishment. So here, as you see in some other places, Republicans or moderates become a kind of faint imitation of the left wing. So they yield on a lot of things. Um, bathrooms, you know, uh, we're one of the most ridiculous things to ever happen in the state of North Carolina, uh, that you could go to the bathroom of your choice, based on your choice of your gender. Um, it should have been laughed out of town, but wasn't. This was pushed, obviously, by the left, by LGBTQ community, but um, it was assented to by the establishment. So I think that co-option or co-optation of, of the uh, education establishment has uh, figured very prominently in this. And I think the most important thing is we are not teaching these kids, you got it right, elementary, middle, high school, the, um, about America. What is America? We talk a lot about the colleges, and that's right. But, you know, as the Jesuits, I went to Jesuit high school, say, give me a child till he's 17, and we got him. What happens in those earlier years, I think, is much more important. If you look at the latest survey on, let's say, Alexandria Octavia Cortez's agenda, healthcare, free health care for everybody, free college for everybody, 
uh, global warming number one priority, uh, you will see majorities of millennials and bigger majorities of Generation Z, which is following millennials. And that is worrisome, very worrisome. A cautionary tale and something we need to address. And we can get into this if you want. We don't just address it by saying socialist, socialist, socialist. We have to explain what's wrong with that view. What is wrong with it? And how do we, we're the real outsiders, get into the educational bureaucracy, educational establishment? Do we need to break it up, formally break it up? Do we need to apply any trust laws to what's going on? Do we, do we keep competing against them with alternatives, homeschooling, charter schools, and so on? How do we address this behemoth? Well, I've been working on this for, I hate to say how many years, but I, I don't know. You're generous to me to say outsider. I said the other day, I was half joking. I said all this socialism stuff, it's my fault. It's entirely my fault. I was the Secretary of Education. What the heck was I doing? I was lecturing on choice and accountability and, and, uh, and charter schools. I should have been lecturing on the history of socialism. Look, socialism is as socialism does. And we can, if you look at history, you see what it does. It immiserates people. It destroys economies. It immiserates people. They don't know the history. If you go into a college freshman classroom and talk to kids, talk to them about anything in history, they don't know it. They just, they just don't know it. It's not their fault, but it is the education system's fault. Um, I don't know about the antitrust. I would yield to you on that. But I do think working inside the system, more school choice, uh, more, I think, criticism of what's going on. But right now the debate, I'll come back to your question. As I'm, I'm talking, I'm thinking about your question. It maybe is worse because a lot of the left now, and, you know, the NEA listens, the National Education Association listens to the left, is now suggesting that school, first and foremost, is not about reading and writing and math and history. It's about social equity and social justice. We can't teach these other things until we have social justice. That's, of course, some, something in their mind, which is uh, you know, yet ever to be achieved by human society. So <clears throat> it's a question now as to whether the schools are about their business in, in, in any meaningful sense. And by the way, if you look at the tests, uh, we don't do very well in math and reading, haven't been for 20, 30 years. But our worst subject is American history. You cannot love a country, and how do you ask someone to defend a country that a, that a young person doesn't know, not familiar with, don't know the story, or if they do know the story, they know the story according to widely used, left-wing, tendentious American history textbooks. Your first really big book was about morality. All right. And it was a super-duper big book. Sold almost as much as a Levin book, almost. But, but it was huge. It was huge. Do you think that book would sell as many copies today? I don't know. Um, I'll tell a tale out of school. I talked to my publisher, <clears throat> and they said we'd like to get the Book of Virtues out again, 25th anniversary edition. However, we think you need to have a co-author who is of a different point of view. Do I have to fill in the rest? And we need to have stories about modern moral predicaments. And we need to talk about, you can imagine, tick, 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 what the agenda is. They want to turn the Book of Virtues into a 21st century politically correct manual. I said, no. Bucks on the table. Can't do it. Crazy. So um, this, is what, this is what happens in the world. I would love to update the Book of Virtues with stories that people have sent me that fit with the overall theme. And it's not about a particular time or place. Morality is timeless. C.S. Lewis says you can no more invent a new, a new, uh, a new moral code than you can a new color. Uh, it is what it is. But um, I give you the world in which we live. I don't know. And that's problematic because that's only 25 years ago. That's right. You can see big changes in the last 10 years. That's right. What accounts for this? Has, has the progressive left devoured the culture so thoroughly that when you look at entertainment, Hollywood TV, the media, politicians, um, the classroom, there's almost no room, no room for people who say, uh, 
time out. Can we talk about liberty? Can we talk about individualism? Can we talk about natural law? Can we talk about some of these things that undergird this great society? Make of that. The, the answer is yes. <clears throat> I was uh, corresponding yesterday with uh, my friend Dennis Prager. You know Dennis. Good man. Dennis has a list, 40 things that the left has destroyed. And you just go down the list. And if they haven't destroyed it, they have tried to. More important, they've tended to take it over. Uh, the schools, um, many of the churches, the media, politics, um, <clears throat> go right down the list of important institutions, character-forming institutions, the mediating institutions, and the left is there in a relentless march. And they want to do this. They are intentional about this. Our guys, our team, you know, ever since the founders, our guys, they wanted to go to Philadelphia, draft a constitution, and get back to their farms, get back to their work. They didn't love to be in Washington. The left loves to be in Washington because it loves to be in control, loves to be in power. And this, of course, is what now became so real and apparent with the candidacy of Donald Trump when he said this to us and everybody or a lot of people realized what he was saying was true, that the, the government was in the grip of, a, of an elite which um, needed to be challenged, and he did. You're a scholar, you're an intellectual, you're a historian. When we come back, I want to know what you think about Donald Trump and his presidency. Okay. Folks, don't forget, almost every weeknight you can watch Levin TV. Levin TV. Just go to blazetv.com slash mark, blazetv.com slash mark. You can sign up there or give us a call at 844-LEVIN-TV, 844-LEVIN-TV. We'd love to have you.